Okay, great. Well, well, welcome to Moat's Orchids, and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Florida Vanda growing, and everything I'm going to tell you is in this wonderful book, uh, which happens to be on sale here at uh, Moat's Orchids, and uh, comes with a beautiful picture of the author on the back, uh, known in his home as El Guapo, uh, and uh, uh, in any case, uh, it's a nice little book, and if you want to acquire one, today would be a good day to do so. We're going to be talking about uh, Vandas, and uh, we're going to talk about any kind of plant. I like to talk about the plant architecture. The way in which the plant is put together tells you a good deal about what the plant requires. In the case of Vandas, what you have are leaves and roots. You don't have any heavy bulbs like in a cattleya or a dendrobium. Uh, you just have those leaves and those roots. And what that uh, tells us is that these are plants that are not built to withstand stress. And keeping uh, Vandas from being stressed is the secret to their so uh, successful culture. You've got to kind of think of them like uh, trade unions. Uh, you know, uh, when all the terms of the contract are being fulfilled, they're very, very productive. Uh, they get a lot done. They'll bloom their little hearts out. They'll produce more flowers longer period of time than just about any other uh, type of orchid. But if you break the terms of the contract, they tend to lay down their tools and walk off the job. So you have to prevent uh, Vandas from being stressed. They want to be in constant growth 365 days out of the year. And uh, uh, there are two points of growth on the plant that we'd like to emphasize, the roots and the crown. The key to being a good uh, grower is observation. They say in Spanish, what makes the crops grow is la sombra del amo, the master shadow. We say in English, master's eye, fat is his cap. And if you're gonna be a good orchid grower, you need to take the orchid grower's pledge, which is, I will look at every one of my orchid plants every day. Now, orchids seem to be slow-growing plants, but uh, when you learn to observe in the proper way, the, uh, you can see their uh, growth and uh, their change on a daily basis. And again, uh, by emphasizing the roots and the crown of the plant, we give a focus to, to our attention. Oftentimes, we're observing our plants in, uh, at uh, 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the evening with a glass of white wine in our hand, which um, makes the task a little more pleasant, but perhaps a little less focused. But focusing on the roots and the crown of the plant with Vandas helps us see what's really happening to the plant, and we'll know if there's a problem in very short order. We like to start with the roots because they are the most palpable uh, uh, part of the uh, plant for observation, and the roots of the Vandas should be in constant growth. They're not, they are uh, under stress. Well, what kind of stress uh, would cause the uh, Vanda roots to stop growing? The biggest one here in South Florida is cold. Vandas like to stay warm. They should n not be chilled uh, for very long below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, and what oftentimes happens in South Florida is that uh, we do chill them a little below that, uh, and that root tip growth will start to slow. And uh, then it will, uh, the next cold uh, spell will come along, and it will slow yet further. And if we allow it to happen uh, too consistently, then the plants will go into a semi-dormant state. Their only defense against adverse conditions is to more or less shut down. They don't have those big heavy bulbs. They just need to be constantly growing, constantly uh, uh, in motion, as it were. So the, uh, uh, you want to keep these guys warm. And when we say warm, uh, uh, we mean that the plant itself should not chill below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if they are predicting a drop slowly across the night and reach uh, 46 or 47 degrees Fahrenheit by early morning, your plants are probably still all right. Uh, because the plant itself will not chill below 50 degrees and when the sun comes up it'll be warming up rapidly. If on the other hand uh, uh, the forecast calls for temperatures to fall very rapidly after sunset uh, and uh, be below 50 degrees uh, by midnight, 
you need to protect these plants. You can protect them by creating uh, uh, wind breaks because uh, if there's a wind blowing and the temperatures are below 50 degrees, the uh, heat is going to be stripped more rapidly from the plants. They are going to chill down below 50 degrees and stay below 50 degrees for a longer period of time. Uh, there are other things that you can do to help keep your plants warm. Uh, uh, in extreme cold conditions, uh, uh, you can run water on them. Oftentimes when we have those marginal temperatures, which we uh, so frequently do in the upper 40s or mid 40s, we will come out early, early, early in the morning and we will turn the water on. Let the water run for five or 10 minutes. Water coming out of the ground here in South Florida and nearly anywhere else in the world is coming out of the ground at about 63 degrees Fahrenheit, about 16 degrees Celsius. Uh, if you bathe the plant uh, in that uh, warm water, the tissue warms up, the sun comes up, the air temperature rises, and uh, bobs your uncle. Uh, it's also a very good practice because uh, if you run a little extra water on these plants, uh, they will tend, it will tend to leach away excess fertilizer salts, and that's always a good thing to do. On really cold, cold nights uh, and during freeze conditions, you can run the water on them constantly, and uh, we have been known to do that. It's quite remarkable what happens when coated over with ice, and the heat of transformation keeps them from freezing. But that's another whole story. Water your plants uh, uh, in the morning, early morning, when the temperatures are marginal, and you'll see a big difference in the growth of those root tips. The um, uh, other way to protect plants from, from excessive con uh, uh, cold is to create an under the bench system with mist heads so that you're putting out water under the benches all night long or part of the night long. Uh, uh, you can do this effectively in a uh, patio or pool enclosure by just getting a little mist head and putting it underneath your vandas and letting it run across the night. The other thing you can do if you have the plants going in the pool area is you can turn on the circulatory pump in the uh, pool and that will bring warm water from the below uh, the uh, surface up to the surface and it will raise the temperature by just that one or two degrees difference that can make all the difference in the world. So you want to avoid letting those root tips uh, stall all, all winter long. If you allow them to stop uh, growing in November or early December, you can lose as much as three months of the potential growth of your uh, roots and of your plants. So by all means, keep them uh, nice and warm. You see, we grow them in greenhouses. In the old days, uh, we used to think that uh, on cold nights, you would just hear the uh, tinkle, tinkle, tinkle of falling band of roots. And uh, then when we started seeing plants come in out of Thailand, we saw them with roots all the way to the base of the plant. And we said, well, what do those Thai growers know that uh, we don't know? And they didn't know anything, but they didn't ever allow their plants to get cold enough for them to uh, lose their, uh, their leaves through cold stress. This plant has lost a couple of leaves through either cold or drought stress. So, okay. Uh, Everyone understands the principles of cold here, that we don't want these plants, the plant itself to chill below uh, uh, 50 degrees. The other thing that can cause that uh, root tip to stop growing uh, is drought stress. Um, and uh, uh, Vandas like a lot of water, but they like to dry out rapidly in between. And I have come up with what I uh, modestly call Moses' universal law of Vanda water. Uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and I find now that everyone is uh, uh, is giving pretty much the same advice. Uh, you want to water your vanda's roots until they turn over all dark green. Not mottled half white, half green like you see here. Uh, you want them to look more or less over all dark green like you see in the uh, on this root here. Can everybody see that? Uh, and uh, these plants were watered about uh, three and a half, four hours ago. They're starting to dry out. But when we were finished watering this plant, the roots were over all dark green. Not mottled half white, half green. Uh, and this uh, rule applies no matter what time of year it is, no matter what the relative humidity is, no matter what the temperature is, uh, no matter how much air movement there is, uh, 
Uh, you want to water your van der roots until they're over all dark green. When they turn back to white, you want to water them uh, again within 12 to 24 hours. Doesn't matter under what conditions are prevailing, that's the rule for uh, watering, uh, watering bandits. And in order to do this successfully, um, you are going to need to know something about the nature of water. But fortunately, it's something that you already uh, know about the nature of water. But I want you to not just know it, I want you to know it totally. As Lenin said, uchite, uchite, na uchite. Uh, uh, we want you to know uh, about uh, water so thoroughly that it is not just thinking about watering. Uh, you want to get beyond thinking about watering. You want to be, uh, this is what Plato is doing with his disciples in those dialogues. He is working through a particular idea until they know it so thoroughly that they don't have to think about it anymore. So what I'm going to tell you right now is uh, Zen and the art of orchid water. The most important thing about water is its cohesiveness. Water coheres to water better than it adheres to anything else. If I were to pour water out on this table, we know exactly what would happen. It would all flow to the edge of the uh, table and 99.9% .9 of it would run off. The water is holding on to that water that flows to it. Very important concept because water uh, will run off a dry surface. And if we start out with our roots as being dry, then that means that we have to get them wet before we can get them wet. And we do that by applying water in two or three applications spaced a minute or two apart. So what you do is you water till the, uh, your first plant until the point of runoff. And then you move on to the next, and 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 the next, just to the point of runoff. Because when water is running off the surface, you cannot get it any wetter with that application. Florida Water Management District uh, wants you to step into your shower, turn the water on, get yourself wet, lather yourself up, uh, and uh, then rinse yourself off because you're not going to get any wetter or any cleaner by standing under that shower enjoying that warm water uh, massaging your back. Uh, but you're going to do it anyway, and they know you will. But uh, you're not getting any cleaner, you're just having a little more fun. But with your plants, uh, just water them at that point of runoff. And then when you get to the end, the temptation is always to reverse your feel. But you mustn't do that. That's not Sloven. If you're going to be a good orchid grower, you got to drag that hose. you got to drag it and you go back to where you began. And at that point, what you want to do is you want to listen. And what you're listening for is the sound of silence. You want to hear that the dripping has stopped. Now some of that water that you applied in the first application of water has been absorbed. There are more water molecules in those roots and in that media, in those baskets that can hold more uh, water. Now you can effectively apply a second application of uh, water and more of that water will penetrate into the uh, roots of the plant. And when you've uh, done that, what you want to do is you want to come back to where you began the third time and you're going to make a decision. Uh, have those roots turned overall dark green? If the answer to that is no, then you want to water them again. One of the things that happens with a great deal of frequency here in the springtime to our vandas is that the roots become so dry that instead of absorbing water, they're repelling the water. The roots start to behave like a cork in a wine bottle. A cork in a wine bottle stays dry because there are no water molecules to absorb other water molecules. As soon as it starts to get wet, it gets wet all the way through and the wine is uh, ruined. Uh, if you see that happening to your plants during the springtime, when we have the big wide swings of day to night temperature here, the best time of year for growing your bananas. Absolutely the best time from March until, uh, until mid-May. Uh, here in Florida, but the mistake that is so frequently made is allowing those roots to become so dry that they become like a cork in the wine bottle. When that happens, you need to uh, apply 
sometimes a third, sometimes even a fourth uh, or a fifth application of water until those roots turn overall dark green and until they are available to absorb water. Very, very important concept. Okay, pretty simple. White roots dry, green roots uh, wet, saturated. We want to saturate the roots, we want to let them dry out again. 12 to 24 hours after they turn white, saturate them again. Doesn't matter what time of year, doesn't matter any other factor uh, in the uh, entire environment. You're observing that one factor. Now some of you may have heard that you should water your orchids before you fertilize. Has anybody ever heard that? Wrong, don't ever do that again. Uh, now that you understand the nature of water and you realize that you're using the water as a vehicle for getting those nutrients into your, uh, uh, into your orchid roots, uh, you realize how silly it is to fill them up with water before you fill them up with fertilizer. So you want to fertilize in exactly the same way as you water, just to the point of runoff with two applications. And you substitute the liquid fertilizer for the water every fifth to sixth water, depending on how rapidly your plants are growing. Just uh, for your curiosity, the, um, the reason that people suggest that you should water your orchids before you fertilize them is that in the old days, the way you made liquid fertilizer is you took a handful of chicken manure or a handful of guano, you threw it in a bucket, you stirred it around, ran it through a sieve. Nobody had a clue what the strength of that fertilizer was, and they were worried about burning their, uh, the roots of their uh, plants. If you uh, see fertilizer burn on, uh, uh, on a orchid root, it will always start at the tip of the root as a browning and progress backward. California has conditions that are almost ideal to grow uh, uh, vandas all year round, but they refuse to learn how to do it. Uh, uh, they want to miss these plants. We rarely missed our uh, vandas except in the hottest, driest weather of spring. Uh, and as they missed it, they're often misting with uh, water that has, a, uh, has mineral content to it. The mineral salts accumulate. They give it a shot of fertilizer. They, all those extra salts are washed down along with the fertilizer. They burn their root tips off, uh, you know, and they think they can't grow them. They could grow them as well or better than we do because we do our best growing across the spring when the conditions are most similar to color. So it goes. Uh, okay, uh, uh, everybody understands about water, understands about uh, uh, fertilizer. Let's talk while we're talking about fertilizer about what kind of fertilizer. Uh, we used to recommend uh, uh, balanced fertilizers, 20, 20, 20, 18, 18, 18. And oftentimes you'd see the recommendation to uh, alternate those balanced fertilizers with a high phosphorus fertilizer, what they call balloon boosters. Uh, and uh, uh, we now know, thanks to those pesky scientists up at the Michigan State University, that we were all, all wrong for all those years and uh, they had the science to prove it that we were giving our plants too much nitrogen, way too much phosphorus, and too much potassium. So uh, the Michigan State formula is uh, about half the amount of, uh, of nitrogen, a little less than half the amount of uh, uh, potassium, and only about a third of the amount of phosphorus. And phosphorus is particularly uh, uh, harmful here in South Florida because our water is so alkaline. The problem with phosphorus is that it's a very active metal and it tends to bind up all the other trace elements which are uh, metallic uh, and it can cause a great deal of harm to the, uh, to the plants. Avoid the uh, bloom booster fertilizers. Bloom boosters, we occasionally recommend a shot or two of it uh, in the spring occasionally perhaps uh, to shock the plants at the first cold snap in the fall. But other than that, as far as we are concerned, bloom booster fertilizers are in fact bloom blocker fertilizers. So, so why for all these years have people been using them and swearing they're getting more blooms? Well, they were, but uh, it's an absolutely perfect example of what we call in logic post hoc ergo propter hoc. Uh, uh, after this, therefore, because of this. They were getting more blooms, not because they were giving the plants more phosphorus. 
they were already giving them six times the amount of phosphorus. When they started giving them 15 times the amount of phosphorus, it didn't make any difference. What made a difference was that now they were giving them the right amount of nitrogen. And so suddenly the plants are blooming more because they have the proper amount of nitrogen. And uh, so uh, don't use the blooming booster fertilizers. Get, you can get Michigan State for the formula online. You can get it from OFE. You can get it from Broward Orchid Supply, all of which are in the sources section here at the back of Florida Orchid Growing. Uh, uh, and both of them have uh, comparable fertilizers that are much cheaper than Michigan State formula. And those are very, very good. They're basically generic versions of the fertilizer. The other two elements in the uh, Michigan State formula that are very, very important uh, uh, and that they discovered was that uh, we oftentimes we're not giving our plants enough calcium. Uh, and uh, not so much of a problem here in South Florida because we have so much calcium in our water. Uh, most of it is unavailable, but there's plenty of calcium left over. But the other big important one is magnesium. And uh, magnesium is what's known as the major minor element. Uh, in Europe, they put four numbers on their fertilizers. And the fourth one is magnesium. Uh, and uh, magnesium uh, deficiency shows up in uh, our plants as a reddening of the, uh, of the foliage. Uh, and so in the fall, when uh, uh, the first cold snap came along, we uh, we would recommend that people give their plants additional magnesium when they started to turn red. We knew that it was magnesium deficiency, uh, but uh, uh, but after the mag after the Michigan State studies came out, it dawned upon even a horticulturist of little brain like me that if our plants are showing symptoms of magnesium deficiency when they're stressed, duh, Bubba Lou, uh, they've been magnesium deficient the whole time. And magnesium deficiency is a chronic problem. Periodically, we go over to Thailand uh, and we bring some plants in because you can't let the devil have all of the best tunes, even though we do most of our own breeding. It, uh, it's good to get some of the other broad lines and uh, get the good stuff as well that they have. Uh, so we brought plants over from Thailand about three years ago and we put them out on our benches and uh, it was a Kodak moment. It was an absolute Kodak moment. Uh, all of our plants which had been on the Michigan State formula for about two years at that point, three years maybe, stayed green. All of the plants from Thailand uh, turned red. And is this because the Thai growers didn't, wouldn't have recognized magnesium deficiency if it had showed up? No, nope. they got scientists there, they would have told them. It never gets cold enough there to show those magnesium deficiency. Well, if you're buying plants that have come out of Thailand, be assured they're probably deficient in magnesium. And the next year, after having been fed on the Michigan State formula and given additional magnesium, those self-same Thai plants red, not as much as they did the first year, but uh, they red. Uh, and uh, so uh, be sure to give your plants uh, magnesium. Your plants are not supposed to turn green. Okay? If they do, give them Epsom salt straight out of your medicine cabinet, one tablespoon to the gallon. If you can get it, potassium nitrate, again, one tablespoon to the gallon. The nitrogen, uh, nitrate of nitrogen helps the plants absorb that magnesium. It's a good thing. The, uh, um, but uh, if the plants are turning red, give them an extra shot of magnesium every week until they turn red. With me on that? Super. All right, good. Hey, well, we're cooking right along here. And we're still talking about those root tips. Nice, big, lush growing root tips. There's one other thing that uh, can cause the roots on a vanda to stop growing. And it's a little insect called a thrips. Mm. You hear people talk about thrip damage. There's no such thing as a thrip. They're all thrips, just like there's no such thing as a phalaenopsis. They're all phalaenopsis. One thrips, usually a million thrips. Uh, and you want to control thrips in your orchid collection, because if you control thrips in your orchid collection, the odds are you will control every other insect pest in your collection, including the wily cucaracha.
And uh, Thrips damage shows up on the uh, uh, roots of Vandas, right at the point where the white and the colored uh, tip join. It will look as if it has been sandblasted. It will look pitted. Uh, mm -hmm. And then what happens is that the, uh, uh, the plant will, the root tip will stop growing. And where it stops growing and then restarts growing, there'll be a little ring. And oftentimes you'll see Vanda roots with ring after ring after ring. Uh, uh, because thrips are like original sin, my brethren. They are always with you. You know, uh, they are out there in the landscape uh, and they are waiting for a nice dry period. When it hasn't rained for five or six days, you can be sure that all the thrips in the world are beating a caravan path to the oasis of your orchid collection where the Vanda roots grow lush and green. Uh, and uh, they will find your uh, Vanda roots. Vanda root is like a, uh, uh, a canary in a mine shaft. Uh, thrips also cause a multitude of other uh, uh, problems. The late Tom Fennell once asked me, looking at a cat Leo with a new growth there, a new growth and a white spot on it, he said, Martin, do you know what causes those uh, spots like that? And you know, at the time I didn't. And Tom Fennell grew um, orchids here, man and boy, in uh, Florida for 60, 65 years. And he went to his grave, never knowing that these, this too was caused by thrips. The browning off of the, uh, the tips of uh, Oncidini that people frequently attribute to improper watering, uh, that too is frequently to be laid at the door of thrips. They are public enemy number one, and we want to control them. What we like to use more than nearly anything else uh, is a, uh, a chemical called acetate, usually sold in the, uh, under the brand name Orphine. Uh, and acetate is very effective. It's locally systemic, which means that it will penetrate into the tissue of the plant uh, and stay there for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, it has the lowest mammalian toxicity of any of the organophosphates, uh, which makes it attractive. The biggest problem with it is it just smells very pretty. It smells for all the world like those chemical toilets at the National Forest. Uh, you know. But you come to love that smell because you think of it as the smell of dead thrips. Uh, it's, it's a little like napalm in the morning, you know. It's, it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, orthene is very effective. There are a number of other chemicals. Bifrin is a pyrethroid that's very, very good. Usually sold under the brand name Calstar. There are other recommendations in here in this book which will give you the Florida State recommendations for uh, 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 controlling this. Incidentally, the recommendations on disease and pest control in this book are the newest and best to the latest uh, out there. So that's another reason to own this wonderful book, besides the picture. The author, of course, but uh, uh, a lot of good stuff in there. So uh, there are home remedies for thrips. Uh, and uh, one of the home remedies is uh, soap. You can use two ounces of soap uh, per gallon of, uh, of water. You need to apply enough of it uh, so that it washes down into the leaf axles and uh, the uh, uh, and into the uh, uh, all the nooks and crannies on the plant because that's where the thrips love to live. They uh, they like to stay in darkness. That's why we see the damage so frequently to the flowers. They've got inside the flower where it's dark. They're happy. About this time of year and a little earlier in the year, we get one of the most frequently asked questions we get is, why do my flower spikes on my bandages get about that long and stop growing? Well, the answer to that is thrips. So you got to get that soap or the, those chemicals into those leaf axles because that's where the thrips are. Right. And uh, uh, you uh, want to water your plants thoroughly the day before you apply the soap. You want to make sure they're not dehydrated. Uh, otherwise, the soap can be a little bit damaging. Uh, uh, but uh, soap can be quite effective. These plants like bright light, but not full sun. They should be uh, a light bright green, about the color that you see here, which we usually describe as a, a shade or two darker than a Granny Smith apple. If the plants are lighter, more yellow than that, they're either not getting enough water, they're getting too much light, or they're not getting enough water. As you increase the amount of light that you give your plants, you're going to need to increase the amount of water, you're going to increase the amount of fertilizer. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, uh, People frequently ask what the little purpley speckles are here. They're kind of like freckles. It's a reaction to bright light. Uh, 
they're perfectly fine, nothing whatsoever wrong with that, uh, that leaf. Uh, but uh, if it's looking yellow, more water, more fertilizer, so less light. If the plant is looking too dark or green, then you either need to give it more light, less fertilizer. Okay. Um, I don't want to get into all the very uh, sundry uh, uh, other diseases and, uh, and pests and problems. Uh, vandas are remarkably free from insect damage. The only time that we see scale insects on vandas is when they have been grown too dark and too lush. Uh, uh, we rarely see mite damage on uh, vandas, but occasionally we do. And again, it usually is, it occurs when the plants have been grown too dark, too lush. Uh, uh, you can spray preventively for mites, uh, it's not a bad thing to do. Uh, we, uh, there are various uh, leaf spotting uh, fungi that uh, affect uh, vandas, and most all of them can, can be controlled with thiophanate methyl. Uh, you can also get thiophanate methyl in combination with another chemical which will, uh, uh, will control the uh, uh, crown rot in uh, vandas, and it's sold under the brand name Banrot. Uh, it uh, is very good for homeowners, single-use uh, uh, chemical, prevent 99.9% of their uh, problems. The other problem, uh, problems that occur are uh, crown rot uh, that we just talked about. It's caused not really by a, a, a fungus, but by an organism that we call a water mold. Uh, there are two of them, Pythium and Phytophthora. And for them, you need other chemicals. Uh, and the one that we recommend to homeowners, uh, uh, in addition to the ban rot, is uh, one called Allium. But if you have maintain your plants in good air circulation, uh, if you keep them in bright light, if you grow them hard, if you allow them to dry out properly between waterings, you should not have any problems with uh, ground rot. But I can tell you for sure that uh, uh, Aliette and Subdue 2E, uh, or Subdue Max now, they're calling it, uh, can stop ground rot dead in its tracks. Uh, and uh, we see it showing up in one or two plants. We spray it from the entire collection and uh, just stuff it dead. All right. Um, one other thing about vandas that's very, very important. They are very tall plants. And, uh, you know, because they are tall, they oftentimes can shake themselves loose or the wind can shake them loose from the container. If you're growing a plant, uh, vanda plant in a container, it needs to be firmly fixed. In the container. You can grow them just on a bare wire, but if the plant is in a position where its roots can come in contact with uh, the container, then you need to be sure that the plant is firmly fixed in it. You have to use every sadomasochist trick you can invent. You tie them up, you tie them down. Now, this plant, as you see, uh, was tied with the green twistum at the, uh, the base. The base of it was tied in. A stake was put in there. It was tied to the stake. And then, because it probably was a little bit wiggly, uh, it was tied off to the side. You can also cross-hatch them, cross-hatch them again. Whatever you do, make sure that that banda does not move, because a banda plant that's moving is, is in trouble. It's like a runner trying to run a marathon in a uh, loose pair of shoes. It's just going to shake itself away. And uh, that, uh, my brethren, is pretty much it. Do we have any questions?